By my own time, it's 10 o'clock. Can all the people who are not muted start muting themselves as we're about to start? Alhamdulillah, we have a guest lecturer with us today. Uh, he came from play. And if you can just mute yourself wherever you are, please, at the right time, we will uh, cause that to change. Please mute yourself. We have tried to mute you from here. Sometimes we have not been successful. Um, Shituleke, please mute yourself. Paju Anima Shang, Buka Kiari, Aidi Waziri. Thank you very much as you, as you do so. Um, hello? Can the guest lecturer hear me? No, very well, sir. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, our usual housekeeping, please mute yourself as much as possible. Mute yourself so that everybody can hear and we don't disturb ourselves. Number one. Number two, as we go through this lecture, um, can you put your questions on the Q&A? We'll capture it here, both ourselves and the guest lecturer, and we'll uh, try our best to ensure that all questions are presented to the uh, guest lecturer. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce our guest lecturer. For those who are here last year, he gave us a lecture, and this is the second time on the platform. Imam Nojim Jimo is a man of many parts. He's a political scientist and a public affairs analyst. He's a qualified chartered housing practitioner and fellow of the Chartered Institute of Housing in the UK, where he trained and practiced for many years. He returned to Nigeria. And I he returned to Nigeria, saw him take up a board level appointment in the oil and gas industry, where he was variously executive director, group executive director, and chief operating officer across a period of 14 years. He's a man of many firsts also, among which is that he was the first person to make the first class honors in political science at the University of Lagos in 1986. He was also the first Nigerian to become a fellow of Chartered Institute of Housing in the UK. A former Amir of the Islamic Awareness Forum, London, UK, is the current national Naibur Amir of the Companion, an association of Muslim men in business and the profession. The member of the Dawa Committee of Lekki Central Mosque, Imam Najim Jimo is currently the chief imam of the Lighthouse Muslim community in Lekki, Lagos. Imam Jimo, the platform is yours. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, in Ahmaduhu, wa nasta'inuhu, wa nasta'ufur. Wa na'udhu billahi min shurure anfusina, wa min sayyate a'malina. Innahu man ya'di illahu fala mudilla la, wa man yudhi. No, 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 it's just, you know, it's past, everybody does lecture. So they have to send you that. Please, 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 Hajia Mariam, please mute yourself. As you come in, check whether your microphone is on. Please go ahead. Ma'am. Hey, Ma'am, we can't hear you. If you are muted, unmute yourself.
امام كي ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ان من يعد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اما بعد all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we thank him we glorify him we seek Allah's assistance and forgiveness and we seek his continuing peace blessings and benedictions upon our noble prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam on members of his household his companions and all of us believers amen i start by thanking our brother our host haji tajuddin fola adiola and his wife haji hajara for giving us yet another opportunity to be gathered here as we started to i believe since the ramadan of 2020 personally i have named name this series ifola adiola kuvi induced series allah says in the quran surah al baqarah a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim allah says asa an takra ushaya wa huwa khairul lakum meaning that you may find yourself in a situation which you detest but goodness may come out of it for you for sure none of us wanted or loved covid but without covid i doubt that we would be having this series in the manner in which we are having it as such at least even if only this something good did come out of uh, covid I beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from the organizers and ourselves and count it on our scales of good deeds. Amen. The topic as announced is the Muslim home and modern challenges. The topic as announced is the Muslim home and modern challenges snippets on marriage divorce and inheritance now what i intended by this topic was to look at real issues happening around us as muslim families some of which the average muslim may innocently be ignorant about but with potentially serious consequences not just here on earth but in the hereafter as I'm well honored. are you in glasgow i'm in glasgow uh it's cold however Still. when i put pen to paper and i started on the first challenge i found that the very first challenge has enough in it to last us for one hour and beyond for that reason my first identified challenge is the only challenge that i'm going to be discussing here today in other words rather than this challenge and that challenge and that challenge which i had intended and to talk a little about this about this about this i'm only going to talk about one challenge today and what is that challenge it is the challenge of a clash of religion in the home i the husband is a muslim and the wife is a christian so is this allowed in islam yes it is allah says so in clear terms in the quran surah al-maida chapter 5 verse 5 it's a very long verse and the starting point of it is allah telling us about things that are lawful to us 
such as the foods of the Christians and the Jews, assuming that the food is not something which is forbidden to a Muslim ab initio. For instance, pork is forbidden ab initio. So then that theme of what is lawful to us continues. When Allah says in the same verse, Meaning, lawful to you, i.e., men, Muslim men, are chaste women from the believers and chaste women from those who are given the scripture before your time, when you would have given their due mark. In other words, Allah is saying to us that the women from the people of the book generally believed to be the Christians and the Jews, that they are lawful to us, Muslim men, and that to give them the bridal gifts that we would normally give to a Muslim bride is what we also have to do. And actually, I would say that if there is any if there is anyone online with a Muslim, sorry, a non-Muslim friend who is married to a Muslim man, I would say give them a call right now and let them join us. And if you are a Muslim brother married to a non-Muslim lady, by all means, if she is not already on board, then time now is to invite her to join us because, inshallah, there is benefit in this talk for the Muslim and for the non-Muslim marriage into a Muslim home. I should mention that a group of our brothers and our scholars take the view that the Christians of today are not the Christians that Allah has in mind in this verse. I'm not going to get into a debate with anyone on this. Rather, I align with those of our scholars, and they are the majority, who take the view that a Christian is a Christian, and that includes the Christians of today. So I am talking about a Muslim man married to a Christian lady. And our starting point will be to examine how a Muslim man marries a non-Muslim lady. How does a Muslim marry a non-Muslim woman? Firstly, all the conditions of marriage as set out in Islam must be met, even as that lady that you are about to marry is a non-Muslim lady. Allah says in his book, say, Fankihu unna bi idhine ahli inna wa atu unna ujura unna bila ma'roof. Marry them with the permission of their people and give to them their bridal gift with goodness, with kindness, with consideration. Allah says additionally, meaning that, and give to the women that you are about to marry, their bridal gift, obligatory bridal gift. Now, to the Christian lady, that a Muslim man sets about to marry, the bridal gift must be given. It is a gift. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La nikaha illa biwaliyin wa shaidaya adilin. Meaning, there is no nikah, there is no marriage without a wali. Wali meaning the father of the lady or a male guardian. And there is no nikah without two just witnesses. Again, there must be witnesses to this akdun, akdun nikah. Akdun actually means agreement or contract. Akdun nikah, marriage contract, marriage agreement. 
right? So there must be witnesses to this marriage of a Muslim man to a non-Muslim lady who must be a Christian or a Jew. Now this raises two questions. Number one, who acts as the wali, i.e. the guardian for a Christian bride? Her father plays this role while she still is a Christian. The father of the lady will be a wali while she is a Christian. Now, now, this is not perfect Islamically, but the marriage would be valid. What would be perfect Islamically would be that there would be a Muslim man in the position of a wali side by side with the non-Muslim Christian father of the lady. But if they are recent, the marriage is valid. That is what our scholars, our teachers have told us. But there must be a wali, a guardian, the person who gives the wife away, and there must be witnesses. Allow me to sound a note of warning here. Anyone who is listening to me and has listened to me up till this moment, should please not quote me anywhere unless they equally listen till the end of this particular point that I am making. So we have a wali, we have seen the witnesses and the bridal gift has been given or has been promised and acceptable to the Christian lady about to marry a Muslim. The last of the requirements, the four requirements of Nika in Islam is proposal and acceptance. And the fact that both of them are standing or sitting in front of people ready to be joined together suffices as evidence of proposal and acceptance. However, for the sake of formality, the question can be asked. Are you proposing to marry this lady? Yes, I am. Are you agreeable to marrying this man? Yes, I am. So now the four conditions are met. Now Allah says in his book, Aurijalu, Meaning that men are the protectors. Men are the guardians. Men are the maintainers of women. Because Allah has given the man leadership over the woman. Or in literal terms, because Allah has made you to excel over them. My Muslim brothers, any such Christian lady so married would have a right to be looked after in the manner that the best of the Muslim wife will be looked after. There cannot be any discrimination on the basis of her faith. And a brother in this situation should equally look after the in-laws in the same manner he would his Muslim in-laws. Not by aiding their Christian beliefs, no, but by generally showing respect, showing regards, and showing generosity to them. So when a Muslim man marries a non-Muslim lady, the lady and her family are to be treated with the same honor that will be due to Muslim in-laws. But here are some sticking points. And before I go into the sticking point, let me sound another note of warning. And this time to the British, American, and Western audiences who may be around us. I am talking mainly to a Nigerian audience. And I've mentioned these British Western audiences because I know from previous editions, certainly from last year's edition, that we had loads of people from Britain and we had people from America as well. 
I'm always bringing in these British, American, and Western scenarios because I lived there in Britain. I studied there. I married there, and I had all my children there. Alhamdulillah. And as I speak, all my adult children live in the UK, so I am never far from there. And by that, I know much. I know how much things are different over there as compared to Nigeria, especially with this topic that I am discussing. Some of the issues that I may raise, though I'm going to raise soon, may not necessarily apply in the UK, for instance, but they apply very much here in Nigeria. And I'll give you an example. If a British scholar or British-based scholar were to be giving this lecture, the possibility that the lady, i.e. the Christian lady and her family, the possibility that they may demand going to church would not occur to a British scholar discussing this issue because all interreligious marriages between a Muslim man and Christian lady in the UK will be conducted in the masjid. It doesn't matter that the lady is a Christian. And the simple reason for this is a typical British young lady enjoys far more freedom from her parents than a Nigerian counterpart. For her, the British lady it will be a case of, met this guy, I love him. He wants to marry me, I want to marry him. We've decided we're marrying in the mosque and that's it. And that's it. The parents of the British girl, i.e. the Christian parents of the British lady would even attend the wedding in the masjid. To my British scholar, the Nigerian parent is different. Don't try that with the Nigerian parents. So my primary audience is the Nigerian audience. Of course, you would find exceptions even here in Nigeria. And I'm sure you would find exception even in the UK. But because I lived there long enough and I witnessed enough marriages between a Muslim man and non-Muslim ladies, I know that all the Muslim, all such interreligious marriages involving a Muslim man were conducted in the UK. So that's my note of warning. So back to the sticking point. Now, since we have said that the father of the Christian lady is our lady for the purpose of this marriage, what if the father insists that the marriage must take place in the church? The answer for us as Muslims is capital, no. Marriage is a religious affair and a Muslim cannot get married in the church under any circumstances. If it means that he sacrifices the marriage, then so be it. But as a Muslim man, you cannot get married in the church. Now, what if the lady says, I'll be a Muslim as soon as we leave the church? I just want you to honor my father in this way. Honor my parents in this way. As soon as we walk out of the church, I'll be a Muslim. My brothers, the answer remains no. What if she says, let's do the church at 10 o'clock in the morning and we'll do a nikah immediately after at 12 o'clock, 12 noon? The answer is still no. You cannot marry in the church as a Muslim. This then leads to another question. What about those amongst us who may have done this in the past, i.e. he married her in the church? I have a good news for you. Your marriage remains valid, Islamically. Your marriage remains valid, provided the four conditions of marriage were met, but it will be a sin committed in ignorance. In your position, I would add a formal Muslim nikah to that church agreement. So all doubts are eliminated. 
but you would then have to regard that church marriage as a sin committed in ignorance, and you would seek forgiveness in the manner that a Muslim would be expected to seek forgiveness. Now saying, I would add a nikah to it. That is me, not Muddin, that is talking. I'm not saying that Islam requires you to do a nikah after. So you may have done this in ignorance in the past, i.e. married in church, but having listened to me up till this point, it becomes impermissible for you to wed in church as a Muslim man, for you wouldn't be able to claim ignorance anymore. From this moment, 10.25 a.m. on the 2nd of April, 2023, to all of you who have listened to me to date, no, you, you, you are not allowed to marry in the church because you can no longer claim ignorance. By the way, viewers and listeners, these issues are so sensitive that I spoke with free scholars on every point and every claim that I'll be making here today. And Alhamdulillah, I found consistency of opinions across the scholars. Indeed, I prayed to Allah in my tahajjud this morning to guide my thoughts, to guide my sayings, and to let no controversy arise as a result of this, of this talk that I'm giving right now. If anything, let union and reunion happen as a result of it, and I prayed to Allah. That is how much I recognize the sensitivity of the subject. So we we'll move on to the second sticking point. The lady, i.e. formerly Christian or idolatrous, had accepted Islam before marriage. By the way, again, emphasizing it, a Muslim man is only allowed to marry a Christian or a Jew, not an idol worshiper. If a, if a lady comes from an idol worshiping home and she confirms that I am an idolatrous, then such a lady is forbidden to a Muslim. You cannot marry a, a, a non-Muslim lady who comes from my idol worshiping home and who is part of that idol worshiping. So what happens where the lady, previously non-Muslim, had accepted Islam before marriage? Who is our lead then? And it gets interesting. Her father or any Christian can no longer be our lead. It would have to be a Muslim. If the family won't agree, then the lady would have a right to appoint a responsible Muslim leader to play this role. It would be better if the person is a relative, but the person doesn't have to be a relative. But for a lady who had accepted Islam before marriage, your father can no longer be your guardian, your father cannot be the one who gives you away in marriage. What about the witnesses? Again, the witnesses in this case would have to be Muslims because at least two male Muslims, and that is because a non-Muslim cannot be a formal witness as an Islamic, at an Islamic marriage. He would have to be a Muslim. There is no doubt that this will bring a strain in relationship between the two families. Yes, I acknowledge that. And this is part of the sensitivities that I referenced a little while ago. But the choice in this situation is to have a strain in relationships with the family or to have a strain in your relationship with Allah. Surely, no one would choose deliberately, consciously, to have a really to have a strain in relationship 
which is Lord. And I would hope that time will be a healer of this wound. But a lady who had accepted Islam before marriage to a Muslim man, her father cannot be the one who gives her away. I want to conclude on this point with two additional points. And the first of this has to do with inheritance. Your non-Muslim wife cannot inherit you upon your death. Should I, reply, should I repeat that? If you are a Muslim man, your wife is non-Muslim and she is allowed to be non-Muslim and death comes. Your wife cannot be an inheritor to your asset while she was or she is Christian at the time of the death of a Muslim husband. And before you would say, isn't this discriminatory? No, because if the non-Muslim man, I mean, if the, if the non-Muslim wife dies before her Muslim husband, then the Muslim husband is equally not allowed to inherit the assets of his dead non-Muslim wife. So Islam balances it. And this is one of the many issues that I imagine that many Muslims go into these interreligious relationships, but are not fully conversant with the full implications of it. To marry a Christian or a Jew is allowed, and I'm saying it with emphasis. But for us to know the full implications is what we are here for today, right? So if your non, if your Christian wife dies before you as a Muslim husband, you are not, Islam does not allow you to inherit her. Now, the expectation of Islam in allowing a Muslim man to marry a non-Muslim, non-idolatrous lady is that she would ultimately become a Muslim. This is because the religion of the head of the house is expected to be the religion of the house. And Islam is very fair in this regard in that rather than allow a Muslim lady to be married to a Muslim man, and then rowing with the man to become a Muslim or over religion, Islam indeed Allah actually forbids such a marriage, such a marriage, i.e., a Muslim lady cannot marry a non-Muslim man under any circumstances. Again, the religion of the head of the house is expected to be the religion of the house. Now, Allah says in the Quran, chapter 2, Surah Tul Baqarah, verse 221. Again, this is a very long verse, but for our purpose, Allah says somewhere in the middle of that verse, Wala tunkihu li mushrikina hatta yu'min, wala abdun mu'minun khayrun min mushrik. Meaning, do not give your daughters that is your Muslim daughters in marriage to a mushrik. Indeed, a believing slave is better as a husband for your Muslim daughter than to give your Muslim daughter to a non-Muslim. So the expectation of Islam is that a non-Muslim wife would ultimately become a Muslim in a husband's house. And by the way, where a Muslim lady insists, this non-Muslim man is the person that I'm, I, I want to marry, and I'm going ahead, that is who I want to marry. Her Muslim parents are not allowed to attend that marriage. Her Muslim siblings are not allowed to attend that marriage. 
And again, this is another sensitive or potentially sensitive issue, but which we as Muslims, which we have to know. Last Sunday, I attended the University of Lagos annual pre-Ramadan lecture. And the mother of the day was Mrs. Adebi Mpegiwa, the MD of a triple G and co PLC. She said at that occasion that she was not born a Muslim and she only became a Muslim through her husband. Now, she said two things which would typically take a former Christian out of Islam. Number one, a husband who is now late. The one who brought her into Islam is no more. The husband is dead. May Allah have mercy on his soul. And the second thing is that she has twice survived cancer in recent time. Now listen to her conclusion. She said, and I quote, I have never regretted being a Muslim, end of quote. My Muslim brothers, my non-Muslim sisters who may be listening, this is exactly the non-Muslim wife that Islam has in mind in allowing Muslims to marry from the people of the book. The husband is dead, but Islam remains in the home. May Allah have mercy on the soul of our brother, for indeed he must have done a wonderful job as a Muslim husband to a non-Muslim lady. Either that, or he was just blessed with a submissive wife. But upon his death, Islam remains in his home. This is exactly what Allah intends. So back to our point about inheritance. The prophet said in a very popular hadith, which you find in Sahih Bukhari and all the books of hadith, the prophet said, and I quote, the Muslim does not inherit from a non-believer. And a non-believer does not inherit from a Muslim. We find this in hadith 6764 in Sahih Bukhari. Elsewhere, he said, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, people who belong to two different religions do not inherit from one another. And by the way, let me make a quick clarification. Inheritance in Islam is different from what we generally, generally call will or a will in our language. A will is that which you share of your assets written in your lifetime. This is called wasiya in Islam. Inheritance is that which Allah has shared. So every time I refer to inheritance here, I am referring to Allah's stated division of the asset. So for those who may not be familiar with this, in the Quran, and I will make, I will give you the difference later, Allah has divided the assets of a dead Muslim who is entitled to what? What proportion of the assets? This is this Allah's division, and then, and then that same division as listed, who is a legal heir, who is Islamically legally entitled to inherit. Allah has stated all this very clearly. So every time I say inheritance, I am referring to that which Allah has divided, which is, bound, which is binding upon the Muslim. So a Muslim husband dies leaving assets. If it is his wish that the injunction of Allah be fulfilled upon his assets, then he would have to leave a will this inheriting the non-Muslim wife, and if there are non-Muslim children, he would have to consciously put down verbally with video recording, with a will registered in court and stamped this inheriting 
non-Muslim children. This is the will of Allah. This is what Allah intends for you. It is not me saying it. However, Islam does not intend hardship on your Christian wives or your non-believing wives. And again, this is why I said earlier that uh, whoever is listening to this, don't go out to quote me until you listen to this lecture till the end. Islam does not intend hardship on your believing wife, especially as she may have been a kind and dutiful wife. She may even have been better in conduct, kinder than a Muslim wife would have been. And you probably won't have married her in the first place if Islam hadn't allowed you to do so. But, and a big but, and please listen to this. Assuming your instruction is to share your assets in line with the Sharia, then you would have written down the share for your non-Muslim wife, now as a gift, not as inheritance. Now as a gift, not something that she is legally entitled to, to. You would have written this down in your lifetime, again stamped and sealed. And Allah allows you, the Muslim man, with assets, Allah allows you to live up to maximum one third of your assets for people who are there to you, who are not legal here Islamically. I, by Islam, these people do not have a right to inherit you. Allah allows you to divide your assets into three. Two thought to be, to be taken by the people who are legal heirs and one thought by people who are non legal heirs. And this would include your non Muslim wife and your non Muslim children. And the maximum of it that, that can go to them is one third. Now, I asked my same teachers that uh, knowing that a Muslim wife who is a legal heir, the most she can have of the assets of her dead husband, if the husband has left at least a child alive, is one quarter if there is no child in the relationship for the man from anywhere or one over eight if there are children or there is at least a child in the marriage, right? Now that the Muslim man is allowed to set aside one thought, can the entire one thought go to the non-Muslim wife? Because this would mean that she is actually getting a higher percentage than she would have as a Muslim bereaved widower. And my teachers told me that yes, if the man wishes to, but it would have to have been written down in his lifetime that if the wife is deserving of this by his judgment, that the wife can have the entire one third, i.e. the Christian wife. So meaning that, uh, I mean, I, I should mention that uh, my knowledge of zakat is not at the sort of level that I can make voluntarily on my own. That statement that I just made, and that was why I asked the teachers. And they said that if he chooses, but that which is better is that what goes to her is not higher than what would have gone to her if she were to be a Muslim. This talk is not about inheritance. It only discusses inheritance as it applies to the unique position that we are discussing, i.e. a non-Muslim wife of a dead Muslim. Whoever is interested in the sharing of assets of a Muslim dead, you see the Quran, Surah Nisa, that's chapter four, verses 11, 12, and 176. The divisions are there, 11, 12, 176. 
chapter four of the glorious Quran. But let me raise two additional questions and then answer them. Can a Muslim divorce a non-Muslim wife because she won't practice Islam with him? The simple answer is yes. A Muslim man can divorce or choose to divorce his wife of years for the simple reason that she refuses to become a Muslim. But I want to say it loud and clear that I am not advocating a divorce and I am not advocating a divorce because Islam does not say that she must become a Muslim to remain your wife and to remain in your home, even though the expectation is that she would become one. No, it is not a must that she becomes a Muslim. And by the way, if we were to be in a Muslim country where the Sharia is the legal system, if a Muslim husband of a non-Muslim wife dies, the state would take the entire assets away from the non-Muslim wife. The state would take it, but we are not in an Islamic state, so we have the choice to do this or to not, to, to not do this. And the simple reason is the state will not allow the assets of a Muslim debt to go to non-Muslims. So again, the expectation is that, I made reference to Mrs. Adebim Pegiwa a few minutes ago, the expectation is that a non-Muslim lady married to a Muslim will be a, or an Adebim Pegiwa. Now, the wife, i.e. the non-Muslim wife can also divorce the Muslim man if her expectation upon marriage is that he would become a Christian with her and he refuses. You know, some of our Christian ladies, they marry Muslim man convincing themselves that I will get, her in, I will get him into Christianity. It's only a matter of time. He would become a Christian with me. By the way, just as it is forbidden for a Muslim lady to marry a non-Muslim uh, man, so is it forbidden for a born-again Christian to marry a Muslim wife. So again, Islam and Christianity are on the same plane in this instance. So a Christian lady whose husband refuses to become Christian would equally have a right to divorce that Muslim. So the same right that the man has to go for divorce is the same right that the woman has to also go for a divorce. Another question, can a Muslim can a Muslim man marry a second Muslim wife because the first wife refuses to accept Islam? Again, the answer is yes, if he has the capacity to do that. And for me, this is probably a better outcome for the first Christian wife than to be divorced because it is possible that some of our brothers are threatening a divorce because their wives are not becoming Muslim with them. You have this additional option of marrying a Muslim lady as a second wife if you have the capacity. And I would actually recommend this for a man who fears that Islam may disappear from his house upon his death. Take a second wife for the, for the sake of posterity and as a means of preserving Islam in your home. You need children 
who will keep praying for you when you are no more. You need Muslim children who will keep praying for you when you are no more. And by the way, to our brothers, Muslims who are married to non-Muslim ladies, you have a lot of work to do regarding your children. Your children cannot be the average your blog child outside. Your children have to be the best of Muslim children because you do not know when death may come and death may come at any time. So make out of your children Muslim scholars who may ultimately even bring their mother into Islam due to their level of knowledge, awareness, and consciousness. Last year on this topic, during the Q&A session, I gave an answer to the effect that where there is a strain in relationships, father and mother are apart, and the children are forced to choose between the father and the mother. Nine out of 10 times, the children will go with their mother. And you just never know where your marriage may go. The chances that your Muslim children will go with their non-Muslim mother is very high indeed. So if your goal in life includes to let Islam remain in your home, then as a Muslim brother married to a non-Muslim person, you have a lot of work to do. I want to conclude on these points. Firstly, and may Allah bless the organizers of these events again. You see, these gatherings will be meaningless unless they help us in understanding our faith better and becoming better Muslims. These gatherings would amount to mere talk shops, except that they help us in identifying gaps in our practices and provide directions in plugging those gaps. Secondly, in that famous ayat on marriage, almost without which the marriage is not concluded, the very first reason that Allah mentions for coming together is litaskunu ilayya. Wa min ayati ani khalaqalakum min anfusikum aziwajal litaskunu ilayya. That amongst the signs of Allah is that he has created for us men, he has created for us women to be our wives litaskunu ilayya so that we may dwell together in tranquility. So living together in tranquility is a major requirement of the Islamic marriage. Where this is lacking, there is no marriage in reality. What are the chances that a husband and wife are living in tranquility who brings up the issue of religion daily? and who makes a brick wall every time he brings it up, is bound to be upset at the very least, is bound to be sad, and she is probably just as sad as well. So the tranquility that Allah has in mind has a higher chance of disappearing from this type of inter-religious marriage albeit allowed for us. Thirdly, and this is very important, obedience to husband is the requirement of marriage in Islam. There is a very important hadith which some of our scholars have actually summarized as all a wife needs to do to gain paradise. The Prophet said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, 
wa sawa mochi ya roha, wa ahsan wa tifarija, wa ata'at bahla, kila la, udu khulu li janna tamene ayi abu wabi ashit. The hadith says that when a lady would observe her five daily salawat, which are obligatory upon her, and she observe her fast in the month of Ramadan, again, another obligation. And then she guards her chastity. And then she adds to all of this obligation, obedience to her husband. It will be said to such lady on the day of judgment that this is the paradise wide opened for you. Enter the paradise from any of the gates of paradise that places you. You know, the gates of paradise lead to different places, all being paradise. Any woman who adds obedience to husband, so her worship would have the privilege of entering paradise from any gate. So to my sister wife, obedience to husband is a must in Islam to the extent that he is directing you to that which is pleasing unto Allah. And if that instruction includes that it requires you to be a Muslim, then Islam expects you to obey. Again, obedience to husband is a must in Islam. And if the Muslim man says, it is my wish that you will be a Muslim, please join me in being a Muslim. Islam expects you to ask, a means of being obedient to your husband to obey that instruction. So my brothers who are, who are in this situation, i.e. Muslim married to non-Muslim, if you are going to be guilty of something before Allah, let your guilt not be that you did not try your best in inviting your non-Muslim wife to Islam. To my non-Muslim wife, if you are going to be guilty of something on the day of judgment, let it not be that your husband invited, invited, and invited you, but you refused and you disobeyed. Islam allows you to marry him and you him. And it is actually not stated in the Quran that you must become a Muslim. But if you hold on to that, then listen to this too. If you hold on to, to that, then you equally have to embrace other legal provisions of the same Islam, such as his right to additional wives, his right to, in, to, his right to disinherit you, is right to choose what proportion of his asset he gives to you as a gift, not as an inheritance. And in the worst case scenario, is right to divorce. So in other words, if you hold on to the fact that where in Islam does it say that I must become a Muslim? Yeah, you would have a point, but the same Islam also allows all these other things that I have mentioned. So you cannot believe in a part of it and disbelieve in a part of it. Once again, I have not urged anyone here to go divorce their non-Muslim wife, even though that remains a legal option for a Muslim husband. I am simply asking us to know the stand of your religion on your choices and to do the right things which will be placing on to your Lord. May Allah preserve our families. May Allah unite our families upon goodness. May Allah bring us together again in Jannah, where all believing families will become one 
again. But again, to my Muslim husbands, married to non-Muslim ladies, if your wish is that your inheritance, your assets, if your wish is that your non-Muslim wife, sorry, sorry, I take that again. If your wish is that your assets be divided, be shared in line with the Sharia, and you equally wish for your non-Muslim wife to benefit from your assets, then you have got to write it down as a will. You have got to have a will. That is what in Islam we have a will. And in that will, you will state that I want my assets, two third of them, to be divided in line with the Sharia, Quran chapter 4, verses, uh, I've forgotten the verses now, the verses that I mentioned earlier, but I am giving this to my wife as a gift from me, and it will become incumbent upon the executors to make sure that your non-Muslim wife has it. If you're non-Muslim, if you should die without this being written down, but your will, your wish stated is that your assets should be divided in line with the Sharia, then I'm afraid nothing may go to your non-Muslim wife. And this is one of the key, very important issues that we want to educate ourselves about with uh, this program today. This topic is entirely my topic. And again, for the sake of those who may not have joined us from the beginning, whereas my intention is to talk about this challenge and move on to the next challenge and move on to the next challenge. When I started to write this talk, I saw that there is enough in this number one challenge to last us an hour. It is one minute past 11 now. Jazakumullah khairan for listening to me. May Allah benefit you and me from this. And if you have said anything which, which turns out to be wrong, may Allah guide us to that which is right in this regard. Indeed, if I find out later on that I said something which turns out to be wrong, I will communicate that and I will request that it be shared. But I did my homework bearing in mind the sensitivity of the subject. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, Alhamdulillah, we invite speakers and we give them the latitude to choose the topics and they send out the topics sometimes and ask what our views are, but haven't given the latitude, our answers have always been, this is fine. Um, at the end of every lecture like this, we thank the lecturer and we try to summarize. But this is um, a technical uh, uh, lecture that even the lecturer was pausing along the line to say, um, these are the steps I've taken. It's, it's, it's um, a lot of rules, but we still attempt to share what we had uh, only because it's still on the platform and he can suggest to us that that which we had may not be what he said and correct us. Uh, we have that a Muslim man can marry Muslim woman, he can marry a Christian woman, and he can marry a Jewish woman. He is only precluded from marrying a non, an idol worshiper, a non believer. Um, a Muslim man, yeah cannot marry a non-Muslim woman in church. These are, these are the technicalities that he introduced that we may or we may not have known before. Um, he, he's, he cannot marry an idolatress at all. Uh, he talked about 
the implications of inheritance on the religion of the woman, a Muslim man cannot inherit from a non-Muslim wife. And a non-Muslim wife cannot inherit. But he was quick to explain that. He's using the word inheritance in a very technical sense, in the sense that a Muslim husband can still gift his wife out of the one third that is allowed to give out as gifts as opposed to inheritance. Uh, and that the two thirds that should go to, that should serve as inheritance is the one that the non-Muslim wife at the point of death of the husband is pre precluded from. I hope I'm not complicating what he has said so simply. Um, and that we have choices. Uh, and based on whatever choice we elect, we can sort things out. And there's nothing wrong in sorting things out. He used a life example of a non-Muslim wife who became Muslim by the time the husband was dying, for those who, who know the family. Um, and quoted her as being satisfied with, with her conversion to Islam. Um, so essentially, it's, it's a religion, a, 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 a matrimonial course that was discussed today from purely Islamic um, perspective. And to the extent that uh, people want to learn more, uh, one lecture may not do it for you. Question and answer may not clarify everything. We all have um, the opportunity to recourse uh, to our different uh, scholars that we know that can explain this, including Imam Nojim Din, uh, Din Jimo himself, who can explain things to us better. Let me then move to the question and answer session. Thank you very much, uh, Imam. Um, you, I saw the, 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 the challenge that you must have faced in choosing this topic and going ahead, going ahead with it. Uh, but your courage prevailed. And um, I hope that we all learn from it. Question number one, is there a requirement for nikah to be held in a mosque? Because you said marriages are in England are um, contracted in a masjid. I think that's the basis for this question. Uh, must must, a, must a, a nikah be held in a mosque? Can you just invite people in a hall or in your sitting room and fulfill the requirements of nikah? That's number one. Number two, I, I hope you are hearing me, Imam. Very, very much, sir. Very All much, right. sir. Number two, what if a Muslim lady marries a Christian man uh, and the man agrees the marriage be conducted in the masjid and to allow the lady to practice her religion in Islam? Your lecture handled that extensively, but like most things, people also come at different times. Uh, please be patient, and maybe you can just um, explain that to the person who has asked that question and those of us who will hear your answer. Question number three. With respect to the will, if a non-Muslim puts a Muslim in his will, can the Muslim accept it or should he reject it? Since you said a Muslim cannot inherit a non-Muslim. Let me repeat that question. If a non-Muslim puts a Muslim in his will as a beneficiary in that will, must a Muslim reject or is he allowed to um, accept? Maybe we should take those three questions and then we go to the next uh, set of questions. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much. Question number one. Um, is it a requirement that nikah be done in the masjid? No, it is not a requirement. You, the, 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 there are only four requirements of marriage in Islam. And once they are met, wherever they are met, then those requirements have been met. And uh, uh, I don't know if it's regarding this that you mentioned the UK one. I said that in the UK, every time a Muslim man marries a non-Muslim, often British, uh, British citizen ladies, that every time, 100% of the times that I was aware of, he was in the masjid. And that is because the average young lady there has more freedom than the average young lady of the same age here in Nigeria. So she meets a Muslim man that she likes, she wants to marry him, and he wants to marry in the mosque, that's where they go. Otherwise, no, it can be in the sitting room of the father of the lady. Just be sure that the four conditions are met. Number two, what if a Muslim lady marries a Christian man and agree to marriage in the mosque? Under all circumstances, it is forbidden for a Muslim lady to marry a non-Muslim, be it Christian, Jew, even more so an idol worshiper, a Muslim lady. Regardless of the agreement that they may have, that don't worry, you can practice your deen. I would even allow our children to be Muslims. No, a Muslim lady cannot marry a non-Muslim. The only way the, man, the lady will be able to marry the man is for him to accept Islam, even if it is 10 minutes before the marriage. But a Muslim lady cannot marry uh, a non-Muslim. Can a Muslim accept a gift? A Muslim man, I imagine, accept a gift from the inheritance of a non-Muslim. Yes, to the extent that it is a gift, stated as a gift, not as an inheritance that you are. Sorry, have. sorry, sorry, Imam, Imam. While we can say that in Islam, we have inheritance and we have gifts, we don't have such stipulations. We may not have such stipulations in other religions. So if you say it has to be called a gift, if somebody says this is my uh, will and lists the beneficiaries of his wills, you understand what I'm saying? And he's not a no. Muslim. So he's not saying that, look, uh, this is from the first two thirds, which Allah has shared. And this is what I am doing by choice. In other religions, people just write their will, okay? And the beneficiaries of the will are called beneficiaries under the will. What the questioner is asking is, yeah. can a Muslim be a beneficiary in a will uh, left by a non-Muslim? Um, your answer says that thing must be called a gift. But okay, that's not I, I, I understand. understand. Yes, yes, now I understand. And I've, I've seen this question asked, and I've seen answers given. The answers that uh, interests me most is that since the person is a non-Muslim, then what she's leaving behind is not an inheritance as defined by Islam. So everything she leaves behind is to the Muslim a gift, a privileged gift. To the extent that it is not an inheritance, is the extent to which he is entitled to it. But I've also listened to scholars say that he who has a high level of human, who knows that if he were to be the first to die, his wife wouldn't be entitled to, to other than a gift from him, that that which is best for him is to not take what his wife leaves behind. So one says, take it because it is not an asset that Islam has control over or right over. It's a gift, everything 
that the non-Muslim leaves behind that is bequeathed to you. The other says, if you are operating at the higher level of Iman, then imagine that the reverse is the case, then leave it, don't take it. And the ultimate answer is, choose whichever one that is convenient for you between the two. Thank you very much. Um, uh, in your in answering that question again, just to help the person who wrote the question, you have um, brought it back to husband and wife. In other okay, words, okay, not uh, husband and wife. Of, uh, that's no. You have brought it to husband and okay, wife. Okay, okay. But the okay. person is just talking about. Okay, let us say that one Chris so far, right? Um, left something for Imam Jima. I think okay. I understand now. All right. It's not his yes. wife. It's not his husband. Uh, her husband. Uh, in my life, I found him useful to me and so on and so forth. I want to leave this for him. Are you allowed to accept? Yes, Islam, say, yes Islam allows Imam Jima to accept and he could accept it. Inshallah. Yes. That situation, that, that scenario that I painted is between a husband and wife, two people in a marriage. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, let's take the next set of questions. What happens to the marriage between a Muslim couple where one of them later reverts to the other religion, particularly the wife? Let me repeat it. What happens to the marriage between a Muslim couple? The two of them are Muslims, okay? I am trying to understand the question. Where one of them later reverts to the other religion, like changes, particularly the wife, what happens? That's one question. The second question is, in the event of a divorce between a Muslim man husband, a, a Muslim husband and Muslim wife. Can the wife claim a share of the husband's assets, say a house, as it happens in Western countries, okay, where the law allows the wife sometimes up to 50% shares in the asset, even if she has not contributed towards acquisition of the asset and vice versa, okay? All right. Um, the next one that I would like you to add to this group, if you don't mind it, is, is it possible or is it permissible for a non-Muslim man to convert to Islam in order to marry a Muslim lady? Because I want to marry this person and I want that person, I'm converting to Islam to allow me to do so. Uh, is the lady allowed to accept the man as okay. her husband? Thank you. Um, so Thank what you. happens to a marriage between uh, a Muslim man, you know, between two people where one reverts to Christianity? If, assuming they were both Muslims and the husband becomes a Christian, now, the lady becomes forbidden to him from that day. Allah says in the Quran, uh, the, the ayat escapes my, my mind exactly as Allah states it, that uh, they are not halal, i.e. the Muslim ladies are not halal to the man and the man, the non-Muslim, is not allowed, allowed to the lady. So if the wife remains Muslim, the husband becomes Christian, right? Now, automatically, in, a, in an Islamic state, the marriage will be brought to an end. And that happened during the time of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is expected of all Muslim ladies where the husband reverts to Christianity. 
but where it is the wife who reverts to Christianity or who converts to Christianity, the man remains a Muslim, the marriage is allowed to be made. But the relationship between a Muslim man and non-Muslim woman, as we explained, remains. For the wife who remains a Muslim, the marriage has to be brought to an end if we want to practice Islam. In the event of divorce between a Muslim and non-Muslim, can the wife claim share of the assets of the man? Even, sorry, even between a Muslim husband and a Muslim wife, claiming of assets of husband is not allowed in all circumstances. Just as we find in the Western world that if the wife is the one who is rich, who is endowed, and there is a divorce, the husband claims part of the wife's assets. In Islam, there is no claiming of assets. However, to the wives that are being divorced, Allah says, Allah encourages men to spend on the women that they are about to divorce. And Allah says, to spend to the extent of your wealth. Allah says, those of you who are very wealthy, to the woman that is leaving your house, spend to the extent of your wealth in being kind to her. To those of you whose means are little, then you spend only little as well. But where the woman is the one who is wealthy, and I hope the non-Muslims amongst us are hearing this as well, the man is not entitled to anything. The wife may choose because she is wealthy and she knows that the man does not have much to give him something. But Islamically, a Muslim man going into a divorce with a wealthy Muslim woman or non-Muslim woman, that man is not entitled to anything. It is the Muslim who has to give to the wife, and Islam is fair to our women and just as well in that regard. Is it permissible for a non-Muslim to convert to Islam in order to marry? Only Allah judges sincerity. If a person comes forward to say, I have, I have changed, I have become a Muslim, we have to take it as he has become a Muslim. If indeed he has become a Muslim or not, that will be between him and his Lord. But yes, once a, one, once a man accepts Islam, then such a man becomes halal to a Muslim lady and you can marry that person. But it's also the prerogative of the lady. The lady can say, I want to see you practice Islam in the next three months, in the next six months, and it's only after then that I will go into a marriage with you. It is the call of the lady. But a man who becomes a Muslim at 11 o'clock is entitled to be married to a Muslim lady at 12 o'clock, just one hour later. And I hope that those answer the uh, three questions. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few more, uh, but we do have time as well. Does Islam recognize the court marriage between a Muslim and a non-Muslim? What uh, marriage? Court, court. They go to court. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Call it registry, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, court marriage between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. If both of them in the future become practicing Muslim, do they have to do the Nikai to certify their Islamic union, even though they are over 30 years married. In other words, when they got married, they were two different religions, but they went to the registry and they got married. And later in life, they became Muslims. I didn't need to do anything else or that marriage subsists. 
Number two, does it mean that a non-Muslim, that non-Muslim children of a deceased Muslim father will also get a gift of a third rather than inheritance? Okay. Um, I hope I'm not running too fast. Sam, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Number three. What about sharing of assets of the deceased to a child from the mixed Muslim home who married? Sorry, the sorry. What, what about sharing of assets of the deceased? Okay. okay. To a child from the Muslim home who married a Christian. Okay. A Muslim girl has gone to marry a Christian. Can she still inherit? I think yes. that's... Okay. Then in this batch, the last one, can non-Muslim children inherit their Muslim parents? Children who have left the faith, are they, do they qualify to inherit their parents? <laughs> Now, uh, does it mean that non-Muslim children only get a gift rather than inheritance? Yes, that is what Allah says. However, one of my teachers that uh, I spoke with in preparing this topic is a justice in the Sharia Court of Appeal. And he said to me in response that each situation will be judged on its own merits. But that the baseline answer is that a non-Muslim cannot inherit a Muslim, and a Muslim cannot inherit a non-Muslim. But if a child non-Muslim asks cause to believe that he or she should inherit is a Muslim parent, and then he said, such in the Islamic world, as well as here in Nigeria, would come before the Sharia court, especially where you find other family members who say, no, you cannot inherit before you're a Muslim. And he said, it will be judged on the case that is presented in court. So it is not absolute that uh, a non-Muslim child may not inherit the Muslim child. And uh, that was the answer that I got on that. And this is exactly why we also have Sharia Court of Appeal. And this is also why issues like this, even in the Muslim court, go before the judge as well, who, have, who are trained to administer issues like this. Does it mean that non-Muslim children only get a gift rather than inheritance? The answer is yes. But the last answer that I gave also applies as well. Now, where a child leaves Islam in the lifetime of the father, and the father tries his best to get him or her back into Islam, and he or she says, no, I'm sorry, I am gone, I am a Christian now. What is best, what is most Islamically acceptable, indeed, commending, is to disinherit that child because that kind of disobedience is not expected from a child of a Muslim. Mind you, mind you, where the father is a Christian and the son becomes a Muslim, the same applies and Islam is fair and balanced in that regard. The son who becomes a Muslim is no longer entitled to inheritance from his Muslim father. So Islam balances it in that regard. Uh, what about sharing of facets the deceased to a child from a Muslim girl? Sorry, that, that third question, um, I got confused. It starts okay. with what about sharing of facets of the deceased? Okay, a Muslim girl, a Muslim daughter has gone to marry a Christian husband. 
Naam. Okay. When her father dies, and let, uh, uh, let's say there is something to share, is she still entitled? That's my understanding of the question. Allah Alam. Okay. Thank you. Somebody is writing online that I should emphasize that the, the most that goes to non legal heirs is a one third. Okay. I did emphasize more than emphasized. You must have joined us late. The person uh, pointing this out to Ross. Now, if she remained, now this is complicated in that she's not allowed to marry a non Muslim in the first instance. But if she marries a, a non-Muslim, who allows her to remain a Muslim? And she remains a Muslim in that marriage. Of course, the marriage is problematic, but to the extent that she remains a Muslim is the extent to which she is entitled to inherit from Muslim parents. Yes, she would have a right to inherit from her Muslim parents. But again, for those who may have joined us late, I did point out that a Muslim girl marrying a non-Muslim lady, the father, the mother, the brothers, the sisters, the siblings, the Muslim family of that girl are not allowed to attend that marriage. And it is forbidden for a Muslim father to give is not a, a marriage to a non-Muslim. Neither can he even be represented by a brother to the girl or a senior sibling or whatever. A Muslim cannot give a Muslim girl a marriage to a non-Muslim. The final answer from the final question from that said, can non-Muslim children inherit their Muslim parents? We answered that already. No. Non-Muslim children cannot inherit their Muslim parents. But if they have a reason to believe that they have a right to inherit, then they would have to go to the Sharia court and make a case and the judge or judges judge on that. I think we have answered those sets of questions. We have answered. Uh, we have in another set. Um, can Muslim children inherit from their non-Muslim mother? Okay. Let me explain that I can, but I think it's uh, straightforward. What if a Muslim lady marries a non-Muslim man via Nikai? And the man changes... A Muslim lady marries a, a non-Muslim man? Yes. Via, via Nikai. Nikai. Okay. And the man changes down the line. I mean, not immediately. Okay. Uh, what happens to them? To, was the marriage uh, kosher? Was it um, was it okay? Is it, is it allowed? Yes. Yes. Okay. Should I go ahead? No. I'll give you a couple more. In the event of a divorce between a Muslim husband and a Muslim wife, what is the entitlement of the wife, particularly with uh, respect to the assets of the husband and custody of the children? Uh, what rights does the woman have? And then one, two, three. Let me add a fourth so that we keep taking them in bundles of four. If you are ready, what is the place of a Muslim man standing as a guardian, i.e. officiating in marriage of a Christian world or relation? You know, this is not the child of the Muslim man. He just has a Christian world or is guardian to a relation who is Christian. What is his place? Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, before this, I think there was a, a part of a question that I forgot to answer earlier, i.e. that uh, two people married in court or in the church, and then uh, they now became Muslims. I asked this question exactly. 
to my teacher. Do they have to do a nika? No. Their marriage, anything that we do in Jahiliya, what we call ignorance, that is the period before one becomes a Muslim, anything that we do is forgiven from the day that we become Muslim. If two people married in church and both now become Muslim, they don't have to do a nikah. They just carry on with their lives and they are, they are recognized as two Muslims who are married to each other. Um, and I think there was a question about marrying in the registry, in the court. Now, Islam does not forbid you to marry in the registry to the extent that it does not remove any of your rights as a Muslim, especially a Muslim man. By the way, you know, a Muslim man can also choose, indeed can make a promise to a lady that you are the only one I'm going to marry and I'm not going to marry any other lady after you. It is within the prerogative of a Muslim man to make that promise, but our scholars teach us to not make that kind of promise. But it will become binding upon him. But if he chooses to rescind on that promise, i.e., to do something different, then Islam allows him from the day he chooses that uh, I am sorry, this promise that I made, uh, I made it in an unwise manner. I, I, I actually do want to marry a second person. That promise does not become so binding that it is now forbidden from marrying a second person. Now to our new set of questions. Can, non, can Muslim children inherit non-Muslim mother? The answer is no, generally speaking. The answer is no. But again, going back, to my teachers and to the justice of the Sharia court, he says that there may be instances in which the court would rule that for this child to inherit is actually better Islamically, and the court can award inheritance to that child. What if a Muslim lady marries a non-Muslim man via the nikah? No, a Muslim lady cannot marry a non-Muslim man, whether via the nikah, via the church, via the shrine, via the synagogue, in the sitting room of the father, in the house of the mother, in all circumstances. Under no circumstances can a Muslim lady marry a non-Muslim man. And I am reasonably assured that born again Christians are also not allowed to Christian ladies are also not allowed to marry a Muslim. I hope I have been rightly guided in that regard. In the event of a divorce between two Muslims, what is the share of the wife? As I've said in Islam, it is in the Western law that you find asset sharing as a result of divorce. In Islam, if the man is wealthy, the Quran encourages him to show kindness to the wife to the extent or to the extent of his wealth and to spend on the wife. But as for the man, if the wife is the one who is wealthy, be a Christian or Muslim, a Muslim husband going into a divorce with a woman is not entitled to anything from the assets of that Muslim lady, wealthy Muslim or non-Muslim lady, unless she chooses to give him a gift. What is the place of a Muslim man standing as a guardian to a Christian lady? No, it is not allowed. It is better that a Christian man stands as a guardian. And in our society here in Nigeria, especially in Yoruba land, there is no family in which you do not find Muslims and Christians. 
And it will be better that a Christian uncle or whoever stand as the guardian for a Christian lady. I would not even know if it's allowed in church, in the church marriage, for a Muslim man to be the one to give the wife away. I wouldn't know. But it is better Islamically that a Christian is the guardian of a Christian lady that is getting married. Hopefully, we've answered those four questions. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope you can still hear me. Um, very much so. What is the position in Sharia of those men that are married to non-Muslim wife in allowing their children to choose either religion? Um, I've seen a lot with uh, brothers from the South that some children in the same house will follow the mother's religion and some will follow the father's religion. That's number one. Number two, can a Muslim man inherit his non-Muslim wife? You have answered that, and that too, we should just um, say no. Um, number, yeah. OK. But the guy uh, proceeded, the gentleman proceeded by saying, if a Muslim woman included in the will later gets converted to another religion before the execution of the will, what, will, what rule will apply? And the last question that I have here, should the one third gift a deceased gift to a non-Muslim creates serious disagreement and crisis within the entire family. So, sorry, sorry, sir. Is the one thought gift, your, your voice cuts there, is the one thought gift? A deceased gift to a non-Muslim no. creates serious disagreement and crisis within the entire family. What happens? Should that will be executed just as written. This could be that the one third gift is more sensitive and lucrative. Um, Imam, if you allow me briefly, uh, before you start answering, the impression seems to be, uh, to have been created that that one third is meant for one person. That is not true. The entire, the entire asset of the deceased is divided according to what Imam told us into three. Two parts of those three, which he called two thirds, are meant for inheritance. One third, which is left, is what is available to other people he may want to give gifts to. It is not that he will be giving one third, one third, uh, to each person, no. Otherwise, there will only be three one-thirds and you can only give three, three people. But after taking the first two-thirds and applying them as inheritance, the one-third that is left is what he chooses to give to people who may not be able to inherit him or her. Um, and they, it may be divided. So it's not like one-third is lucrative and is superior to one eighth or one something. No, it's out of that one thought that he may give to his non-Muslim wife, that he may give to his non-Muslim children, that he may give to his uh, Christian, I mean, uh, people he wants to bequeath this to his old school association and so on and so forth. That is my understanding so that we don't carry one thought as uh, this is what we are going to give to somebody else uh, uh, involved. I hope that um, I understood your, your... Yes, very very much so, sir. That was exactly what I said, that uh, the person, the owner of the asset, is allowed to give up to one thought. It does not even have to be one thought. It does not even have to be one or zero at all, but is allowed if he wishes to give up to one third of his assets to non-legal heirs. 
people who do not inherit him by right. And that one third, right, can go to 100 people. He can go to 10 people. It is up to him who he gives that one third to. The, the share of a Muslim wife in the, in the asset of a Muslim man dead, right, is one quarter where there is no child in the relationship. Why is one quarter? Because if he leaves parents, the parents are entitled to inherit. You know, in, in, in the Yoruba culture, no parents wants to inherit their uh, children. But it does happen that children die before their parents. Rather than leave the children, uh, the parents in penury, because especially because the, the deceased may have been the person looking after them, right? So Islam recognizes parents, father and mother, as part of the legal heirs, those who would inherit. Then Islam recognizes the sons in their rights. Islam recognizes the daughters in their rights, right? Now, Islam recognizes brothers and sisters in certain circumstances. Again, I will get the reference to us very soon, the parts of the Quran, the reference that I gave before, where you can read about the Shia. Islam has shared everything. Who gets what? What percentage of it? And anyone who wishes that his asset be shared in line with the Islam, you don't have to divide it that this percentage goes to this. No, in your will, you simply state that I want my asset to be divided in line with the Sharia. If you like, add the verse. If you like, it's even better you don't add the device. And then the executors are the ones. And by the way, in Islam, you cannot disinherit a Muslim child under any circumstances. He's a bad boy, never listen, disobey the parents. If he remains Muslim at the time of the death of the parents, the Muslim child cannot be disinherited. If he, is, if he or she is disinherited, the executors are required by the Sharia to give to that disinherited child the share of the assets that Allah has given to him. Now to our question. Those those men married to non those women are they married to non-Muslim men. Allah allowing okay, okay. People married to non-Muslim and allowing the children, a Muslim man married to a non-Muslim lady and allowing the children to choose their religion. It is forbidden in all circumstances in Islam. I am equally assured that it is forbidden in Christianity as well, that a man is a born again Christian and by some whoever is married to a non born again lady and then he gives the children the right to follow your Muslim lady if you like. No, I am reasonably assured that this is not allowed, right? In real Christianity, in all circumstances, a man, a Muslim man, is not allowed to give the children freedom to choose. Rather, he is required to raise them as Muslims to the point that they would not have any doubt about their religion anymore. And I pray to Allah to give us the will with all to be able to raise our children to the point that they wouldn't have to worry as to what they do. And a Muslim woman included in the will, okay, if a Muslim woman included in the will later converts, i.e., you know, in Islam, inheritance is to be attended to at the earliest opportunity following the death and the burial. Once you have buried, the next thing to do is to attend to the issue of the inheritance. Why? Part of the reasons is there may be many people dependent on the deceased and whose death, whose life will be left a gap by the death of the deceased. So to make sure that people are not struggling to breathe 
Islam allows us to share the assets of the deceased at the earliest opportunity. Now, the wife is a Muslim at the time of the sharing of the assets, and now she lives for Christianity. To the extent that she was a Muslim when the assets were shared is the extent to which the assets are hers. But in an Islamic state where the Sharia is the rule, if she leaves Islam, if there is confirmation that these assets were not hers, have an issue, they were the assets of her Muslim husband given to her, and now she's left Islam, the Muslim state will claim those assets because the assets of a Muslim is not allowed to go to non-Muslim other than what he gives as a gift in his lifetime written down. But where the lady is a Muslim at the point of sharing the assets, then it is us if she later converts. Is the one third gift of a disease? Okay, if the one thought creates a disagreement in the family, can the one thought be executed? Again, hopefully, this one thought has been explained. I explained it hopefully clearly in the course of the talk, and it has also since been explained. One thought is the maximum that can be given to non legal heirs. And uh, it can go to as many number of people, including your driver, including your cook, including your buffer, including your neighbor's son who helped you in your old age. All of them can be accommodated into this one thought. This one thought is not for the wife, right? But if the man chooses as a gift to give it to the wife in his lifetime, then it is hers, i.e. to the non-Muslim wife. But one thought does not go to one person. It goes to a wide variety of people who may not be uh, Muslims or legal here. If you give me one minute, sir, I'll just grab my notes and then uh, look for the reference for the people again. <laughs> Now, for anyone who wants to know how Allah has divided assets of a deceased Muslim, this is discussed in the Quran, chapter 4. Please note that down. Chapter 4, verses 11, 12, and 176. All the people that by right must inherit, and it's a must. They are listed there as father, mother, brother, sister. By the way, in Islam, a brother or a sister can only inherit where the deceased does not leave a child, a male child, a male child. Where the deceased has even one, just one male child, that one male child knocks out all brothers. That one male child knocks out all sisters. Now, the brothers and sisters would now be accommodated within that one thought that we have mentioned. But where the deceased does not have a child at all, then the brother or brothers become legal heirs by right, not by privilege. And the sister or sisters also become legal heirs where by right, not by privilege, where the deceased has not left the male child. So, Quran chapter 4, verses 11, 12, and 176, the list is given there. I think we can Thank take you very much. So a set of questions. So we can manage our time well. Uh, we have only six minutes left. There's a very, there's a question here that's uh, being asked. Is it okay for a parent to share all their wealth while they are still alive. So there's nothing, uh, so that they don't go into these complications of uh, inheritance. While you are alive, you have a, you have a right to, to give to whosoever you want to give your property. 
by the time you are dying, you have very little left. What's your, just give us two minutes on that and then we can. Now living in a non-Islamic, you know, in, in the Islamic country, right? The, the world goes to who the Quran has this, said. The this is not goes about to, Islamic country now. We've had now one. This, so so li living, living in a non-Islamic country, where there is the possibility of a row following the death of a very wealthy man, it is actually a must that a person does not die without leaving in notes on how his wealth be shared. Or in, in leaving the notes, a Muslim person, right, that note cannot be in contradiction. No, you cannot share your wealth in your lifetime so much so that when you are dying, there is nothing left, right? Now, because the people that you have been sharing the world with most likely are the same people who are going to inherit you. However, if you choose to give gifts to your people, right, it becomes gifts. Now, yes, you have a right, sorry, you have a right in your lifetime to give things to people, but in doing that, you bear in mind that I am not doing this to contradict what would have been the right of these people upon my death. If you're giving out what you own, would disadvantage somebody who is a legal heir upon your death that Allah has stated that is not allowed in Islam. If doing that does not disadvantage that person, for instance, your children, they are legal heir, your brothers and sisters, if you don't have a male child, they are legal heirs, right? Or your brothers and sisters, if you have at least one male child, they are part of the one third. In fact, that one third you can give out in your lifetime, knowing that the rest I want to be shared in line with the Sharia. And it is a must for a Muslim that his assets be shared in the way that Allah has shared it. I hope that answers the question. It's okay. Um, the topic itself that you treated today, uh, the question and answer has turned this into uh, inheritance simplicity. But what you discussed was more of, about the Muslim home, matrimony, what is possible. And I don't want us to also lose that uh, because we're now at who can share, who cannot share, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what questions are asked is what I present uh, to you. And um, to the best of your knowledge and ability, you've addressed uh, things. When things are technical and uh, border on the law, uh, Sharia on the law, all we can get is a guidance that anytime we are faced with uh, reality, we need to go and seek for that particular, for our own reality, what is uh, uh, what what we can do and what we can't do? Um, bringing questions uh, will give us guidance, but they don't solve the problem because we don't tell the person we are asking the question the full circumstances all the time. So that's just the guidance that I want to I want to give. Uh, Imam Nojim Jim Jimo, as um, as usual done his best, uh, he has dared, he has go, gone on the limb to say, look, we cannot be gathering and be running away from what makes us who we are. Let us be taking these topics on. And it's not all the time that answers are what we want to hear, but answers must be correct, must be truthful. And um, according to him, he has um, even gone ahead to ask people who are more vast, in certain areas than he is, in order to be confident of what he has told us today. Uh, may Allah continue to guide us uh, and guard us in, the, in, in, in our life's journey and in our aspiration to be better Muslims. Uh, before we leave, may I uh, invite Imam Jimo to give us the closing prayers and then thereafter we'll bring this meeting to a close. Bismillah. Okay. Um, 
Alhamdulillah. I was actually just holding the Quran and I was going to read out exactly how Allah has shared. But I'll leave that. Hopefully, people have taken notes of uh, the reference. Again, um, I thank uh, our senior brother, Mr. Adeola, for uh, emphasizing that my conclusion that uh, we are Muslims guided by religion. Sometimes we find aspects. Sometimes we find aspects of uh, our religion that are tougher upon us. Yes, that is the religion, and we do not make the rule. Allah makes the rule. Other times we find aspects of the same religion that are indeed to us, very kind to us. Let us remember that statement of Allah, that uh, from what you find to be tough on you, may be goodness. And from what you think is good for you, may be that which is not good for you. May Allah guide all of us to correct understanding of the din. May Allah give us the iman to be able to embrace those aspects of the din that we think are tough. May Allah perfect our affairs for us. More importantly, may Allah give us the wherewithal to be able to raise our families as Muslims, such that when we leave our home, when we leave the surface of the earth, we will be leaving behind Muslim families who will continue to remember us. Rabbana, habla no mena aswajina, maduri yadina kuro talahayun, wajalna lishmutakina imam. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi li akhiyar, wa sallamu tasliman kathira, والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Um, I forgot to let you know, Imam, that uh, at peak we had about seven. We had seven hundred and twenty-seven people that listened to you and um, that asked you questions, just for you to, to know how many people you applied to. Um, Thank you. And uh, next week, at exactly the same time, um, our next lecturer, Imam Dr. Sheikh uh, Bashir, will be addressing us and the topic that he will be treating is. civic responsibility in an Islamic paradigm. Civic responsibility in an Islamic paradigm. Uh, again, is somebody we are very familiar with, Imam Dr. Bashir Ali Umar from Al Furkan Mosque in Kano will be addressing us at 10 o'clock next week. Thank you. May Allah make it easy for him and may Allah make it easy for the rest of us. Uh, thank you very much once again for allowing us to coordinate this as I bring this meeting uh, to a close.